Chapter 52. Um, chapter 52 now, what we're going to be doing is getting um, pretty broad and talking about ecology and the biosphere. So this is like pretty, pretty broad subject matter. Um, so why we care about this is because when we're trying to figure out stuff about organisms, plants, animals, fungus, bacteria, whatever it is, we want to know what's going on with them as far as what their requirements are from the environment, how they react to the environment, do they tolerate change well, all those types of things. So we can divide those into biotic and abiotic factors. Now biotic, bio means life. So biotic means living factors. And in Latin, anytime you put A in front of something, it means not. So abiotic means non-living factors. So we're going to start out by talking about the biotic factors or those living factors. And that more has to do with like the role that they play in the environment. So are they an herbivore, a carnivore, a predator, a prey? Um, do they pollinate? Are they parasitic, free living? So those are the biotic factors that they're going to come into play with. Then, as far as abiotic factors go, those can be further divided into chemical or physical factors. So they're all listed here. Um, first one that's a really important one is temperature. So temperature, and I should mention this T with a little degree, that's shorthand for um, temperature. Um, so anyway, temperature is important because we have a range that we're comfortable in and that we can live in, and if it's too high or too low, that can cause problems. So temperature can definitely be related to metabolism and metabolic rate, and the faster your, or the higher your temperature is, the faster your metabolism will go. The other thing on the other end of it is temperature can affect freezing, right, if it gets too cold. And remember, what are our cells mostly made of is water. And what happens to water when it freezes is it expands. So we definitely don't want our cells to freeze because that would cause them to burst. So we have a temperature range that we're going to be comfortable in. Now there are going to be some organisms that produce like a natural antifreeze, and those ones are actually going to be more comfortable at a colder temperature, but that's because their cells don't freeze. So um, temperature is going to have that range. We don't want it too high. We don't want it too low. All right. Next one is water. Um, once again, we have a range. We don't want to have too much water. We don't want to have too little. And there's something like a cactus that doesn't want a lot of water that could really get hurt. And then there are other plants that, um, you know, can't get enough water. They have to have a ton of water, water, you know, like algae and stuff like that. So too much or too little can definitely affect an organism. So it's going to have a range for that. And then the next one, salinity. <clears throat> salinity is talking about salt. And obviously there are going to be some organisms that have to have salt to survive. And that has to do with the salt concentration in their cells. And remember the whole isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic. That's going to affect what direction water moves in a cell. So they're set up to have salt in their cells so that they can handle living in a salty solution. Whereas for us, we don't really tolerate salinity that well. Neither do most plants. What's cool is that there are certain organisms like birds and certain types of trees that can tolerate living in salt water but they have special glands that help them to extract and secrete that salt so it doesn't get into their system so that's another factor right there um, sunlight so obviously we can definitely have bad effects from too much sun exposure and we can have bad effects from too little, right? Too much sun exposure is going to give us sunburn and blisters and cancer. Too little, we're going to get scurvy and things like that, right? So we definitely have to have a balance. And same thing for plants. Um, then for rocks and soil, that's going to have to do with the pH of the soil, mineral composition of the soil, and actually the physical structure. Is it sandy? Is it clay? Is it rocky? Um, and that's going to determine what type of plants live there and then what kind of animals live there as well based on the plants. Um, so those are all going to be the factors that are going to come into play for an organism and where they're going to live and how they're going to react to the environment. Now, the next part is talking about climate. So in this chapter, we're going to get into um, woo, sorry, how climate affects organisms and where they're found. So one word that we're going to use a lot today is going to be biomes. And you learned about biomes in like fourth grade science, which was like the desert and the tundra and the rainforest and that type of stuff. So we're going to talk about those, but in a little bit more detail. Um, so the two things that are really going to affect the distribution of biomes is going to be solar heat, so energy coming from the sun, 
and then that's going to affect global circulation in the form of wind and water currents. So those two are really going to be affected, um, or affecting where biomes are distributed. So let's get into how that works. Um, the sun is really going to have a huge effect on climate, obviously. And since the Earth is round, I hope I'm not blowing your minds by telling you the Earth is round, um, what's going to happen is there's going to be different angles of sunlight hitting the Earth based on that curve that it has. And so the poles are going to get less solar energy than at the equator, right? So that's definitely going to um, account for climate differences that we have. Um, the other thing that's going to be a factor is, the, is Earth going around the sun and its orbit, right? So hopefully you know how long it takes the Earth to go all the way around the sun, and that should be one year. I had one class tell me it took 24 hours. I was like, really? Um, so no, it takes an entire year to go all the way around the sun, and the Earth does go around the sun. The other thing is that um, it's rotating on its axis. Now one rotation on the axis is what takes 24 hours. But the big question is, why do we have the seasons that we have? And so that has to do with the fact that the Earth is not straight up and down on its axis. It's tilted. So if you look here, this is actually showing that tilt. So we're in the northern hemisphere, and what that means is, if you look at how we're tilted on this journey around the sun, there's going to be some times when the um, northern hemisphere is going to be very close to the sun, like in the summer. And then there's going to be times when it's going to be further away because it's tilted away from the sun, and that's in the winter. And then in the fall and the spring is when it's doing the transition between the two. So the tilt of the earth on its axis is what actually affects the seasons and causes us to have the seasons themselves. Now, in this next slide, this is showing you how these circulation patterns are going to form. So what I want you to concentrate on first is going to be this part right here. So um, what we're looking at is zero degrees, that's the equator. And then we're going north and south to the right and to the left. So what's going to happen is you've got solar radiation that's going to be hitting the earth and it's going to be hitting the water. And so what will happen is as it gets warm, it's going to evaporate and turn into clouds, right? So it's going to do that, but as that um, air is going up, it needs to be replaced. And so what's going to happen is air is going to come from the north and the south to replace it. Then what's going to happen is when it gets up here, it's going to condense and it's going to rain. And so it's going to form these little cells that you see here. Now, if you look over here, you can see that these cells are going to occur all the way up and down the earth. And what's going to happen as a result of that are going to be these trade winds, right? So that movement of air is going to cause these trade winds to form. So um, these are pretty permanent wind patterns that are going to be on the earth. Now, one thing I want you to notice, and it's a little tough to see, but hopefully you can point it out, is the fact that above the equator, you can see it kind of forms this clockwise rotation, and below the equator, it's going counterclockwise. So that's all going to be the result of what's called the Coriolis effect. And that has to do with um, the Earth turning on its axis, and it kind of causes things to spin off like that. Um, what, so what happens, you may have heard people say like, oh yeah, if you flush a toilet above the equator, it goes this way, and if you flush it below the equator, it goes this way. And that is true if you have a certain type of toilet that doesn't have jets pushing it in one direction. Um, I spent a little bit of time right around here, uh, actually right here, in Kenya, and we were right on the equator, and so we actually did take a bucket and um, put a hole in it and then filled it with water, and we went above the equator, and you could definitely see it go clockwise um, as it swirled out, and then below the equator it went counterclockwise, and then right on the equator it actually just went straight down. See, this is what I do when I'm in a cool place like Kenya. I'm cutting holes in buckets to do experiments. Anyway, um, so those are going to be the global wind patterns that we're going to um, have and the um, Coriolis effect. Now, another thing that can happen is mountains can affect climate, right? So if you look here, we've got that jet stream that's going um, from west to east across the United States, but we know that we have a lot of mountains right there. It's, I mean, we live right in the mountains here. And so those mountains are going to have effects on the um, precipitation as well. So... Um, a couple of things that mountains can affect climate-wise. First one is going to be sun exposure, right? So obviously if you're up here at the peak, you're going to have way more exposure to sun than if you're down here in the plains. And so that's why if you were to go up into the mountains, you want to make sure you put extra sun protection on because you're closer to the sun. 
Um, another factor that you're going to notice is temperature, right? Um, in the summer, every time it gets really, really hot down here in Denver, most people escape to the mountains because it's a lot cooler up there, okay? Now, the last thing that mountains can do is they can form what's called a rain shadow, and we see this effect in Denver all the time with the weather that comes in. So what happens here is we've got some moisture laden clouds so they're ready to do precipitation and if you think about the way Colorado is set up here's our mountains this would be where Denver would be like right over here so you've got these clouds and they've got to pass over the mountains which means they're gonna go up before they go over if they go up we already said it's gonna get cooler at that higher elevation and as that gets cooler it's gonna cause condensation to happen and so it's gonna dump all of this snow and rain on this side of the mountain called the windward side and then on the leeward side which is going to be this side of oops sorry this side over here there's going to be a rain shadow and so it's going to skip us and then it'll actually have time to regenerate and go over the plains so that's why when we have these snowstorms that come from west to east Denver usually doesn't get very much because we have that rain shadow effect but then the plains get dumped on because that it actually has time to reform so the times when Denver actually gets dumped on pretty hard is when we have a flow come from north to south. So when it comes from like Fort Collins and Greeley down in our direction. And then it doesn't have any mountains to go over and that's why it can dump on us. And I always joke with my husband, if I go outside and I haven't even seen the weather and I can smell Greeley, which we all kind of know what Greeley smells like, kind of smells like manure. If I smell that when I go out my back door, I'm like, oh my god, I guess it's going to snow. And sure enough, it usually does. And that's just because all of that wind is coming down from north to south and bringing that smell, and eventually it's going to bring the snow. So those are the ways that mountains can affect climate. In the next section, we're going to get into the different biomes and how those work.